Good evening. I'm Shreya, and on behalf of Proteus, the Biology Club of Isotavium, a very warm welcome to all of you. I hope you've been enjoying the symposium so far. Today, we are thrilled to host Mr. Gregory Udan Jr., who will be speaking on Dance for Health, Therapeutic Benefits of Dance. Just a short speaker intro. He's an experienced human movement scientist with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education and nonprofit industry. A graduate of the dance program at Hofstra University, he holds master's degree in motor learning, motor control, and applied statistics from Teachers College, Columbia University, where he served as the lab manager for the Neuro Rehabilitation Research Lab. Skilled in gait, biomechanics, motor learning, motor control, dance science, and statistics, he uses data science techniques to analyze human movement, especially in developing dance programs for communities with neurodegenerative disorders. I request everyone to keep their microphones muted during the talk and to save your questions for the end. So without further ado, let's begin. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna get the presentation up. Okay, um, so thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, so my name is Gregory Udan Jr. Um, using dance to optimize neuro rehabilitation or the therapeutic benefits of dance. Um, these are just a few of the organizations that I am involved with. Um, I'm on the research committee for um, the National Organization for Arts and Health in the US. I'm the research and advocacy coordinator for Dance NYC. I am a Westheimer um, fellow for the Dance for PD program through the Mark Morris Dance Group um, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I sit on the board of Heidi Latsky Dance, and then I am on the um, Development Committee and the Strategic Planning Committee for um, the International Association for Dance Medicine and Science, which all of that um, influences the work that I do and what I will be talking about um, today. Um, so just to give you a little bit of um, background on myself, um, I, I was a professional dancer um, for, for many years here in New York. Um, I primarily focused on um, modern dance or American modern dance. Um, but one of the companies that I spent eight years with um, was Heidi Latsky Dance. Um, and that is a physically integrated dance company. And that's what really led me into um, my work in human movement science and wearables and in um, people with disabilities. So Heidi Latsky Dance, um, is a physically integrated company, meaning that half of the dancers are disabled and half of the dancers are non-disabled. Um, so the mission of Heidi Latsky Dance is to refine beauty and virtuosity through performance and discourse, employing performers with unique attributes to bring vigorous, passionate, and provocative um, contemporary dance to diverse audiences. So, one of the things that I always um, like to start off talking about is that Heidi Latsky dance um, is a art producing company or a dance performance company. It is not meant um, to be seen as therapy um, and it is not meant to um, replace any form of therapy or treatment. Um, what Heidi does is mainly to create artistic dance works um, with a diverse uh, group of performers or a diverse cast. Um, that comes up a lot because um, there is a lot of people who do what is called um, dance therapy, but dance therapists are um, typically also trained in psychology and working more on um, an emotional capacity with dancers um, or with, with anybody. Um, what I really focus on and what I really study is the therapeutic benefits that are inherent in any dance program. So there's been a lot in the news and in the media and more and more research is coming out about how exercise um, may aid Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, these really um, neurodegenerative um, diseases. So this is a study that I just like to um, start off with, which is a study that was done in 2015 by a group of Italian researchers. Um, and they were looking at individuals with early stage Parkinson's disease that underwent uh, multidisciplinary 
um, rehab treatment. So what you see on the bottom is um, the time points. So there are four different time points here. And then on the Y axis, you see um, the amount of medication in L-DOPA, which is a medication that is used to, to treat um, the symptoms of, of Parkinson's disease. So what you will see is that the group with the circles are the control group and that the line with the, um, the squares are the group that received the multidisciplinary rehab treatment. And what you notice is that at time point zero, they were receiving the exact same amount of um, medication or L-DOPA. And that as time continues, the group that was not receiving this multidisciplinary rehab treatment or this exercise program increased their need for L-DOPA where the amount of L-DOPA that was needed for the group that was receiving the exercise treatment was a lot smaller um, and that we know that exercise has the potential to delay the need for pharmacological interventions but we also know that exercise is an important adjunct to these medications and that similar models such as this um, you know in parkinson's disease also exist in um, ms where physical therapy and exercise are seen as integral pieces um, to, to the management of the disease. And the work that I do with um, Dance for Health or um, the therapeutic benefits of dance is really based off of this idea that exercise and movement can really help um, people with movement disorders or neurological um, diseases such as Parkinson's. So just to give also like a little bit of, um, of background here, right? Like you'll see in this model, which is adapted from Petziger et al, is that exercise um, can lead to the increased synaptic strength of the connections um, in the brain. It can also improve overall brain health which strengthens the circuitry of the brain and then looks um, or relates into improved behavior. What I really look at is the improved motor behavior, but that is not the only benefit that is seen from these dance interventions, which I will get into a little bit later. But again, all of this work is stemming from the idea that physical activity is driving this neuroplasticity. I also really like um, a quote from David Marr, who said that trying to understand um, perception by studying only the neurons is like trying to understand bird flight by only um, studying feathers, that it cannot be done. So John Krakauer has also been a big proponent of this, that neuroscience also needs to study behavior so that this is why um, we really focus on this motor behavior or the cognitive behavior. And we're not only looking at um, the chemical reactions um, in the brains or the strength of the, the synapses or, or what's happening in the neurons, um, but we're also looking at the, the output from the brain, which um, in our case here is uh, motor behavior. Um, so Robert Butler was the director of the National Institute um, of Aging um, here in the United States. And he said that if exercise could be packaged into a pill, it would be the single most widely prescribed and beneficial um, medication in the nation. The thing, though, is that exercise isn't a pill, right? We actually have to get people to do it. Um, it needs a lot of motivation or support. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you don't want to do it right. And that's where not only these dance interventions, but these art-based interventions have a real benefit because I always like to say, like, it hides that exercise pill, right? And it gets people to want to participate and to want to be motivated and to want to continue to do this physical activity. Um, and that's what's really, really important here. So I like to also look at this in like, what does exercise address? And that exercise can have improvements in strength, in stamina, flexibility, 
um, postural stability or balance, um, gait, and um, in Parkinson's, uh, a tremor reduction. But that these exercise programs um, typically take a, a piecemeal approach or even um, a lot of physical therapists take a piecemeal approach. And what I mean by that is that they emphasize one area of the body at a time, such as like strengthening the legs that they rarely talk about the whole body um, participating in movement or how one part of the body should be actively grounded um, to free the other side of the body. Um, so that, you know, traditional exercise programs don't um, acknowledge the expressive or the emotional content of movement. Um, it doesn't always like uh, get at this imagination um, or get at this um, mind-body um, kind of connection or emotional connection to the movement. So that there's a benefit um, here that is in dance that may not be in other um, exercise forms. And I'm not saying that these other exercise forms are not beneficial, right? There's a benefit to movement that is strength and flexibility and all of these benefits that we're seeing with trauma reduction, but that there is the potential for, for more. So one of the things that I've studied, right, is um, motor learning. Um, and motor learning is really, you know, how the brain learns um, to improve uh, movement patterns over time and that this is a relatively permanent change. We say relatively permanent because it requires practice and requires all of these things and the lifespan is a scale. Um, but I, I always like to highlight that dance um, has a lot of these motor learning tenants in it um, that we that are already inherent in dance programs and this is where the therapeutic benefits of dance are coming from so that looking at dance right like it can develop strength flexibility stamina and balance um, what you see in the picture here um, that is on the the right is that there are um, participants with Parkinson's disease that are also using the bar, right? And that this bar provides a little bit of feedback and a tool um, for balance. And, you know, highly trained dancers, all dancers really use the bar um, for support and training and balance. So this is something that already happens um, within it. Um, we were also talking about that practice and that dancers really master skills through repetition, right? Um, and that this repetition of movement is what's going to drive this neuroplasticity and be able to create those new movement patterns because they're able to practice them um, in this meaningful way. I also slightly mentioned that, um, that we, dancers express meaning through movement and gesture, that the dance moves aren't um, disconnected, um, that we often use uh, motor imagery or the image of like a bird or some sort of story that people are trying to, to uh, emote in their dancing. And that this is often um, a very beneficial thing because it can also um, stir the, the cognitive processes that are happening um, within the brain as well. And one of the things is that dance uses movement to initiate and um, and guide movement, right? Um, and in Parkinson's disease um, in particular, there has been a lot of benefits of what's called external cues or cues that are outside of the body. So with people with Parkinson's, you can um, play a metronome, which will just give a rhythm or a beat, and that that will help to ease um, movement and allow them to be able to perform this movement smoother. And the thought process is that um, there's a lot of uh, damage in the basal ganglia that happens with Parkinson's disease. And that the thought is that with music or with these external cues, you're bypassing um, that broken or damaged circuitry in the basal ganglia and that you're able to access the movement through a different sensory um, perception or through a, a different sense. Um, sound and visual cues um, being some of the most uh, predominant. Like if you put tape lines on the floor, for example, you can get people with Parkinson's to take larger, um, larger steps.
Also, dance uses aesthetic goals and imagery um, that is, you know, getting this imagination, getting this other process going. And that one of the things that I think can't be underestimated is that they're they're dancing together, right? That they are creating a community um, and that this is happening and that there's this social benefit of dance class. And this is one of the things that the participants in these classes and in these programs and even the, in the research, you'll see um, repeatedly, right? That dancing or arts um, for health interventions can help address loneliness, that it gives them a sense of community, it gives them a sense of purpose, it gives them a sense of a place to go. And although COVID has um, made it difficult for us to renew, uh, you know, join in physical space, they are still coming together virtually on Zoom. And the Dance for Parkinson's classes um, that, that I teach uh, through the Mark Morris Dance Program or that others teach um, as well has a uh, time on Zoom for participants to just chat with each other before and after. Um, we may even do small breakout rooms so that we don't lose um, that social component. Often too, they are um, sequencing movement, uh, mirroring movement, improvising and remembering movement, right? So this is getting at that um, that memory, it's getting at these cognitive processes, um, all that are happening at the same time. So coming back to that initial picture that we saw um, about the exercise programs, right, that dance really has more because it has this cognitive simulation, this musicality, um, movement sequencing, facial and physical expression. Um, one of the things with Parkinson's is that they get reduced um, facial expression because the facial expression is a movement and all of their movement tends to get smaller. Um, we also see adherence to these dance programs that they like coming, that they get to interact, that their mood, their memory, confidence, creativity um, gets better, um, that they have a better relationship with their partners or caretakers because typically in these classes, we also um, involve the, the caretakers um, as well. Um, and this uh, increases self-efficacy, self-esteem, um, and uh, spatial awareness. So there's been a lot now in the news as well, right, about dance classes um, for neurological uh, conditions. I would say that the work of this um, dance for neurological conditions really started with um, Parkinson's disease, right? That was the first one. and. Um, there are um, Madison Hackney from Emory University in the in the U.S. really started a lot of this work um, looking at ballroom dance. Um, specifically, she did adapted tango um, because that adapted tango gave people with Parkinson's uh, a support system, right? Um, gave them more balance. But also, if you look at tango, Tango is um, taking large steps, right? And with Parkinson's, one of the symptoms is that they start to take shorter and shorter steps, or we may even see some, some shuffling um, or some freezing of, of walking um, throughout. So that the thought process was that this would be better because they would be practicing taking larger steps with music, with a partner, and that these would help to create that neuroplasticity and relate into um, activities of daily living. Um, so there's also been, you know, in the news just about dancing, um, reversing the signs of aging in the brain. There's also, if we're just looking at um, non-disabled uh, dancers, there have been bra brain changes that happen just from participating in like ballet classes um, or, other, or other forms of, of movement. Um, Oftentimes, too, a lot of people um, ask, like, well, what um, what dance classes is better or what type of movement? I would say that we don't really know for sure, like from a scientific perspective, but the best is what they're going to enjoy and what they're going to come back to. Right. The Dance for Parkinson's classes in Mark Morris, we don't just do modern dance. I teach um, salsa or merengue because that is my background. Um, we have teachers that have taught um, classical Indian dance or um, African dance or um, 
you know, kind of the, the gambit of, of movement. So it's really about finding things that are going to, um, to get people moving um, in uh, maybe a little bit of an aerobic way, but also a safe way, because uh, you do have to take the concerns into account. Um, the typical dance for Parkinson's classes um, start in a chair, right? Because we kind of eliminate that, that balance component for a while so that they can start working on their legs and working on their upper body, and then it'll, um, it'll grow from, from there. So a lot of the, the research has now looked at dance being this new framework, right, for rehabilitation or the hope for dancing, right? Um, and the thought process behind this is really that um, in a lot of um, traditional therapy, right, we have separated our cognitive training and our physical rehabilitation training um, to get like separately. So they'll go to cognitive training to work on their memory and to work on all of these um, different processes. And then they'll come to physical therapy to work on their gait and their balance. But what dance does um, from looking at that thing earlier uh, is that it brings it all together, right? That we're working on cognitive, we're working on physical activities, we're also working on memory, we're also working on sequencing. There's also a lot of these sensory things that are happening with music or with a mirror or with looking at somebody doing the movement and then translating it into their own bodies. So that there's a lot happening and that this is kind of like a super pill, right? For exercise or like a super pill um, for people with Parkinson's and that this is why we're seeing um, a lot of these, these benefits. But I'll come back to one of the things that I said earlier, um, looking at Heidi's company, but also looking at the Dance for Parkinson's program or a lot of these programs is that we always say that we're learning an art form and that we're not fixing a problem. These dance classes are not taught by medical professionals, right? Often, sometimes there, there is a medical professional here and there, but oftentimes it is trained dance teachers uh, that are, you know, versed in the symptoms and the, uh, the background and the disease progression of these diseases, but that they're really teaching them dance and getting them to participate in physical exercise and that it should be a way for them to almost like forget about the disease or within the community. Like we never try to say um, this is good because you have Parkinson's, right? Like we try to embed different things in the choreography that might be beneficial. Like one of the things is that they get a very rigid torso. So we might do a lot of upper body movement or torso movement, right? Um, but that's not just good for people with Parkinson's, that's good for, for anybody, but we're trying to embed, right, or hide that exercise pill um, to kind of get at some of those uh, motor impairments that we are seeing. So I've been talking about the, the symptoms, but I just wanna go through them a little bit in more detail um, because this is really where this work um, really started that there is the bradykinesia or the slowness of movement, um, the rigidity, which we were just talking about in the trunk. Um, about 70% of people with Parkinson's have a tremor. Not everyone has a tremor. Um, postural instabilities, which is that balance or that um, risk falling. Um, gait complications, those smaller steps, um, maybe wider steps uh, for, for balance. Um, you may even see that, that shuffling that we were talking about. Um, freezing where they're not able to move. Um, one of the strategies for freezing may be to put the tape lines on the floor that we were talking about to get that, to bypass that basal, basal ganglia to increase um, that external cue and get them to be able to overcome that and, uh, and move through it. So the motor symptoms are really kind of the face of Parkinson's, but it's not the only thing, right? Um, there is a lot of these non-motor symptoms, and these non-motor symptoms are really what's affecting quality of life, and that these non-motor symptoms or this reduction in quality of life is also reducing physical activity. Um, so we have to kind of look at this holistic picture and this holistic um, individual person. And when we're thinking of these programs, right, tailoring it to the individual, finding um, what they're able to do, giving them autonomy um, to participate. Um, sometimes in some of the classes we'll let uh, participants choose music. 
um, you know, or, or different things like that. And like looking at it from um, a motor learning perspective, there is the optimal theory of um, motor learning, which was created by um, Gabby Wolf and Rebecca Luthwaite, um, which looks at autonomy and enhanced expectations and that those autonomy and ex, um, enhanced expectations can actually increase motor learning. So trying to get those um, incorporated into the uh, dance programs, but also just like um, using what's already inherent in these programs. So looking at the research, I said that there has been a predominant amount done in um, Parkinson's disease. Um, there is an array of single studies that look at everything from contact improv. Uh, you know, I was talking about Madeline Hackney's work, which started with partnered tango, then it went to unpartnered tango to seeing if they could still do that. And now they're looking at um, partnering with robots. So the the verse of this work has has grown um, uh, extra, um, an extra enormous amount. So looking at this review, um, this looked at um, 10 papers that were included, um, seven of which exa examined like walking speed, nine that include balance, um, one that looked at upper extremity, and eight of them looked at like a measured disability rating. Um, so one of the things that has come is that, that from this research or from these reviews is that compared with traditional gait training or other rehab interventions, dance um, is safe, fun, and alternative way to um, achieve these functional changes. Um, and that we've seen improvements in gait balance and quality of life. Um, not in this review, but in other reviews, I have mentioned that we have seen um, cognitive changes um, as well. So one of the things, though, is that a lot of these studies, um, not, or I should say, um, even though a lot of these studies may have had a control group, but they don't have an active control group that is um, participating in exercise that is not dance, um, which might be a better comparison or that um, they might not have um, the, the same rigor of, of research, but that there are measurement outcomes that are included, like safe toler uh, safety, tolerability, quality of life, and falls, and that these have really shown um, tremendous effects, and that we've seen uh, treatment effects with very, very low or minimal adverse um, event rates of somebody getting injured by participating. And it, these programs also have very low dropout rates. Um, so this is another review um, that was looking at 13 different articles. Um, and this was looking more at the, um, the dosage. And they found that um, two one hour dance classes per week over 10 to 13 weeks um, had beneficial effects on endurance, uh, motor impairment and balance. Um, and what their conclusions were that is that dance may be helpful for some people with PD and that this provides uh, preliminary information to um, implementing the, these programs. So this was actually just published um, maybe two weeks ago. Um, and this is a fascinating new study for me personally, because this is the first study that has actually looked at longitudinal effects of participating in pro uh, dance programs. So. The thing that I've said a lot of times in research uh, with Dance for Parkinson's is that these are a lot of one-off studies. So this is great that now we're moving into more longitudinal um, work. And what they were actually able to show in this study is that there was a decline of the um, Movement Disorder uh, U uh, Society's Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which is the UPDRS. Um, which is a disease measure of um, Parkinson's disease. Um, and it is the most commonly or like the gold standard uh, measure that is, that is used. Um, so they had uh, motor rates that, um, their motor rates didn't really decline. Um, many of the dancers showed no increased motor impairment from where they started. Um, whereas the PD reference group that did not participate in it um, it did increase it. So if we think back to that Italian study that I showed at the beginning of which got the exercise treatment and which didn't and their need for um, pharmacological interventions, we're seeing the same kind of trend here, but um, in, in motor impairments. Um, they also found that non-motor aspects um, of daily living um, experiences um, showed 
no significant decline, but that there was a difference between the two groups. Um, so that the training or the dance program was effective at slowing both motor and non-motor symptoms over a three-year period. So yes, this is a three-year period, but this is very exciting because this is the first longitudinal study that has come out um, in this area of research. So I've spent most of my time um, talking about Parkinson's disease because that's where the bulk of the research is, but I do want to mention that this is happening in other neurological diseases as well. Um, so this is a study that looked at participation in arts and leisure, um, dance classes, um, for people that had uh, dementia, um, and it was unclear if um, participation in leisure activities lowered the risk of dementia of participation overall. But from the results of the study, they actually found um, that playing musical instruments and dancing were the ones that were related um, the most with a reduced risk of dementia. Um, so that dancing and musical activity, or if you think of dancing, it has both of, of them in there, um, that actually did have a reduction um, in dementia. And again, this goes back to that framework of rehabilitation, of that they're doing both cognitive and motor and problem solving and movement problem solving, kind of all of the same, um, uh, this, uh, all at the same time. And that these results were also similar for people who had Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, um, showing that participation in these also had reduced rates of decline in memory and increased cognition. Um, so this is showing that overall um, dancing is the, the most um, beneficial. So what it, I'll just give you a breakdown of some of the percentages of what was re uh, uh, related to a reduced risk of dementia. They had that reading was related at 35%, um, bicycling and swimming was 0%, uh, crossword puzzles for at least four days a week was at 47%, um, playing golf was 0%, but that dancing frequently was at 76%, and that this was the greatest risk reduction of any activity studied, cognitive or physical. Um, so I just like to really highlight that because we're getting both that cognitive and that physical together. So there's been a new work that's done in Huntington's disease, uh, which Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder um, that is passed down by uh, one parent who has the disease. And um, if you have a parent who has it, you are at a 50% um, risk of it. So this study looked at dance um, participation, but it was um, using the video game Dance Dance Revolution um, and they found that even after the intervention that the participants wanted to continue um, doing the physical activity by playing this video game and this dancing, and that this had um, benefits in walking and in balance. So we were seeing those motor impairments. Um, this was probably, this was done in 2013, and this was one of the first studies to look at dance in Huntington's disease. Um, now there has been uh, probably two more studies um, that have looked at dance and Huntington's disease. So this is really um, a new of our burgeoning field, um, but it's taking from that dance for Parkinson's literature and moving it into other neurological um, disorders. Same in the in the stroke uh, uh, world for people post-stroke. Um, there has probably been maybe 10 to 15 studies um, in people post-stroke. Um, what they have found is that there are gains in um, gait and balance uh, that that have made and that dancing is a fun and motivating activity um, for these people and that it is safe um, for them to do um, that when they participate in these programs for about 10 weeks uh, that they can see these these changes. But, you know, nobody's really done a longitudinal study post stroke yet, but I would assume that this would be similar to the ones that would um, happen in, in Parkinson's disease, but I would really like to see um, some uh, more long-term studies that are happening in people post-stroke over three or five years, because they are having, um, you know, it is safe and feasible, attendance and satisfaction is high, and they are getting these uh, improved benefits, but 
Um, we still don't have any sort of randomized control trials in people post-stroke. So there's a need for more rigor um, in the research for people post-stroke. Um, so this is some nonprofit research that was not published um, in a scientific journal, but I do want to, to highlight um, because this was also just published uh, shortly after um, the Parkinson's longitudinal study. So within the last two weeks, but maybe more like a week and a half. Um, and this was a review looking at the overall research for dance and well-being, um, not disease specific, but just overall for aging and healthy life. Um, and they found a lot of increasing evidence between dance, health, and well-being, and the arts. Uh, they are suggesting for more programs like this to to be to uh, come to fruition. That there is um, an understanding that these are complex and multi-dimension or directional interventions. That um, although the intervention is working, we don't always know what the secret component is inside of it. Or you know, there's still questions about like the dosage or maybe what style of teaching. Um, is best, uh, but that they really are encouraging more people to participate in programs like this and that attention um, and more research should be given because all of the signals are there for physical, mental health and well-being um, as forms of improvement for, um, for populations. Um, this was also um, another great, uh, this is a scoping review um, that Daisy Fancourt and uh, her colleague, um, Swersa Finn, did um, in collaboration with the World Health Organization. Um, so what you see on the, the left side of the screen is a little bit of a logic model, looking at the different components of social interaction, physical activity, um, engagement with themes of health, um, cognitive simulation, emotion, all of the things that we've already talked about. And then they break out the responses from participating in these programs um, at physical, um, you know, physiological, psychological, social, and behavioral. I won't spend too much time because we've kind of already talked about all of those um, and that the outcomes are prevention, um, management of the disease, treatment, and then promotion of health. Um, so the World Health Organization is also realizing that this is a very um, beneficial area. And many countries, such as the UK, have actually started to do what's called social prescribing, um, where they're actually able, to, uh, doctors are able to prescribe um, people with neurological diseases to go participate in dance classes or go participate in arts programs. Um, and that this is seen as something very beneficial. So while this is still new and burgeoning, um, there is a lot of strong evidence that is coming out and more and more keep, continues to come out. Um, so just to talk a little bit too about, um, you know, I was talking about the wearables and the data science at the, the beginning. So um, I really look a lot at these um, motor behaviors uh, such as gait and balance. And what I use is a lot of wearable sensors. Um, you know, there are uh, accelerometers that can give me a lot of the gait parameters such as step length, step width, gait speed. And that a lot of benefits of these wearables are that people are actually able to wear them during a dance intervention. So we can actually see what their movement is doing and see how their movement um, changes over time. So that these wearables are really a useful tool or like a window to understanding our um, understanding of brain disorders. Um, and I'll come back to why this is important is because neuroscience also needs to study behavior or biology also needs to study behavior and that what these um, wearables allow us to do is quantify these motor behaviors so that we can make inferences about behavior and the control processes that are happening in the brain so that we can look at these effects of treatment or training. We can also start to look more at these questions of dosage um, and other questions that are, that are still inherent. Um, so I just you know have a dancing brain here for you and the, the takeaways that I really want um, people to take away from this presentation are that exercise is really good for brain, for brain health, um, that dance includes both physical and cognitive benefits that are combined within dance interventions that really kind of have this super component and that this may be a strategy for neuro rehabilitation, but more research is always needed, right? So we still need a lot of randomized control trials, these longitudinal studies, um, but that's where the work is, is going now. 
Um, and then I just want to say a thank you to all of my um, collaborators and the companies that have, have helped me along the way so that these interventions that I'm talking about um, have the potential to not only improve activities of daily living, um, function, and quality of life, but also have the potential to meaningfully affect um, or impact um, disease progression. Um, so thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, I will open it up to, to any questions. Thank anyone you has. so much. The talk was amazing. I personally found it very interesting. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, they can just raise their hand and uh, unmute, or you can always put them in the chat box as well, so you can see them. So um, the question that just came into the chat um, is, compared with actual movement, um, how effective is motor imagery in curing neural disorders? Um, so the vocabulary that I would use is not curing, right? Because a lot of these movement disorders are neurodegenerative um, in nature, which means that there is going to be this disease progression that happens over time, right? And even with medication or pharmacological, we don't necessarily have a cure yet, right? What we're trying to do is slow down um, that progression of the disease and what movement uh, what motor imagery does is that it allows for the same sort of circuitry to start firing in the brain without actually producing um, movement patterns, right? Or like actual physical movement so that they can think about that movement and work on, you know, bypassing some of that circuitry and imagining it, getting it longer. And what imagery also allows us to do is we were, I was talking about that um, damage circuitry in the basal ganglia, that it allows us to kind of bypass that circuitry and access the motor cortex, right, and movement through, um, through this motor imagery. So it can have a lot of, of benefits. Um, there's a lot of research done in motor imagery um, that needs, it needs to be meaningful to the person, right? Like if I say move like a bird and the person has never seen a bird before, like that's not gonna be a good image for them. So it is a little bit of like give and take, you know, here and there and finding what works for the person, finding what doesn't work for the person. If the person can't move yet, or, you know, does not have that um, capacity yet, like, motor imagery might be a really good way to to get them to start you know firing some of those neurons in the same way it may also help them to um, connect with a little bit more emotion or uh to emote something so that we can get you know maybe the that facial recognition back or even just motor imagery is increasing the cognitive processes that are happening so um i wouldn't say that it's uh you know necessarily curing but that it has a lot of benefits that can be used in tandem with a lot of other things. I hope that that answers the, the full question. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is, uh, so what exactly is the role of uh, time and plasticity? So if someone comes for dance classes for say maybe two or three years and then they stop for maybe six months, is there a decline in the, you know, the the like betterment of the symptoms or whatever that they were experiencing? So that is a really, really good question. Um, if I'm honest, I don't know the answer to that because we don't have the research on that yet, right? Like this is the first study that looked at the, the longitudinal effects of dance. So that, that decline, right? Like we know that when people don't practice that there is a decline right um in movement and also with neurodegenerative diseases right without any form of intervention there is going to be a decline what we don't know is how long that lasts for right or how long that effects lasts for um a lot of the the first research right that was done in dance for parkinson's was like you know um we call it a retention test of like when some period of time has passed um, so we've been looking at it like, uh, you know, uh, 10 minutes uh, later or an hour later that those benefits are still there, right? But like, this is the first one to look at those benefits over three years. 
So like whether that lasts for three months, whether that lasts for six months, like, you know, how long does it last if there's like a touch up session, right? Like, you know, if they come in, you know, um, once a month or, or things like that, um, those questions are still not answered. So I don't really have a good, um, you know, like to be like, oh, it's, it's six months. Um, but, you know, what I will say is that a lot of these um, benefits are because people keep coming back because they enjoy it right and they have this community and things like that and even one of the um i would say one of the surprising things of of covid actually is that it made these dance for parkinson's programs a lot more accessible right so i actually teach um a dance for for pd class um in spanish and now i get participants from spain from mexico from Peru, you know, who don't have access to these types of programs in their area. So they, you know, are able to join us. So like, even after, you know, COVID, we're actually planning on keeping some virtual classes because it has increased the accessibility of these programs um, for people to be able to participate. Uh, yeah, thank you. So my second question was about, um, you mentioned different types of dance styles that are done. So is there, one particular style or another that is found to be more effective for certain disorders? So that research has not been done yet um, because all of the studies that kind of exist look at it um, from like a, a one or a two off perspective, right? Or even like the, um, the longitudinal study was looking at the Dance for Parkinson's program, which is modern dance over three years. So there hasn't been um, comparative studies to see which uh, form is better than one or the other. Um, what I will say, though, is so this is my anecdotal thoughts, right? Not based in any um, in, in any science. So I just like to, to put that out there. But like, you know, a lot of the reasons why um, tango started right uh for dance for parkinson's is that they were already take that D tango has these larger steps and one of the symptoms of parkinson's is this reduced step length right so thinking of of things like that or like i um was helping out with a stroke study where we used merengue dance right um because the people with um post-stroke typically um, have one side that's more impaired than the other and don't like to bear weight into that side. So the constant weight shifting between the two was really beneficial um, for them. So, you know, I think that like thinking about what some of the symptoms are is, is good and like what's inherent in each dance form. But I don't know that like, for me, right the most important dance form that's going to be better for somebody is the one that they are going to come to <laughs> right like even if like ballet you know tends to be the one that has the most improvement if they don't like ballet and don't come to ballet like they're not going to get the improvement right so for me it's more about adherence um and like joy of movement um so i find that um everywhere and I don't know um, specifically, but I do know that there are a few Dance for PD teachers in India um, that are using classical Indian dance um, in India. So if that is of interest, um, I can send that to you afterwards. Um, I would need to just do a little bit of research, but I know who to ask and I know I can get that. So if people are interested in that information, I can get that to you. Yeah, so that would be very helpful. I think we can pass it along to other people yeah. that know. Great. Yeah, uh, Harshini has a question. Just unmute, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. That was a really interesting session. Uh, I actually did ballet uh, like for a few years, so it was very cool to see the uh, effects that dance could have on your physical as well as cognitive well-being. Uh, so the question that I had was, uh, like at the beginning of the talk, you had shown us about uh, how levodopa, uh, the requirements for levodopa is like uh, decreased with uh, dance therapy in Parkinson's patients. Uh, again, and you showed other studies about how neuroplasticity increases with dance therapy. So would you attribute the positive effects of dance therapy to increase neuroplasticity or to more secretion of dopamine or is it a mix of both? 
Yeah, that is um, that is a really good um, good question. So I also, I guess I didn't mention why the reduction of um, L-DOPA is beneficial, but um, there's a lot of side effects that happen with um, the increased amount of L-DOPA that are side effects from the medication that are not side effects from Parkinson's disease. So a lot of times they get dyskinesia, which is like this excess movement, but people with Parkinson's prefer that, or prefer to be able to move, right, than to not be able to move. So as time goes on, they'll need more and more levodopa to get the same effect, right? Because their brain is not producing that, that dopamine. Um, and that this is what, um, the more that they need, the more side effects um, that they have. But to answer your question about um, what I think is happening, again, I don't. We don't have those studies because a lot of those require, you know, people to go into a machine, like an MRI and things like that, and like we're not able to get people dancing while they're doing that um, yet. So like we don't know, or like you know, EEGs are more mobile, but with dance, there's just so much excess movement that it makes the processing of like an EEG signal very, very difficult. Um, so we don't have that. But um, what we do know, right, is that um, through joy and through movement production, that there is this de this um, uh, increase in, in dopamine, right? And that with Parkinson's disease, there's the death of the dopaminergic neurons in the brain. So what we're, I think that we're doing is actually slowing down the death of the, the, uh, the dopaminergic neurons. I don't believe that we are creating new dopaminergic neurons, right? Like, I think that the ones that are dead are are dead. And like, through dancing, I don't know that you will be able to reverse that process. Maybe there will be some more other s sort of cure or medication um, in the future. Uh, but I don't know that we would be able to actually get that through dancing. But I do believe that what we are doing is, um, you know, slowing the rate of death of these dopaminergic neurons. And then I also believe um, that we, uh, I was talking about that neuroplasticity and that circuitry, that the dance is actually um, increasing the strength of the synaptic connections so that their movement patterns are kind of easier to access um, and that they're able to move more freely or to be able to move a little bit bigger. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, I'm going to put um, my email into the, the chat um, as well. Um, if anybody has any questions um, after the fact or needs more information, I'm more than happy to, to help anybody out. So um, you'll have my email there and feel free to share it with other people in the symposium who were able to come. So I'm, I'm happy to, to be a resource in that way. I see. Okay, so if no one has any more question, I think we can wrap up the talk. So just, I'd just like to thank. Um, okay, Rajni, yeah, go. On. Yeah, uh, sorry, I just have one more no follow-up question. Uh, yeah, so is there any reason as to why the majority of the studies are focused on Parkinson's uh, as compared to other neurological disorders uh, like, say, LS or post-stroke uh, paralysis or like? Are there any disadvantages with focusing on those diseases or? Um, I don't think that there's any um, disadvantage to focusing on those diseases. I just think that that's not where a lot of people has focused their time. Now, more people are moving away from Parkinson's and into these other disorders because there's been so much work in Parkinson's. The I think that the thought from a lot of these researchers were that like, oh, you know, dancers are already working on practicing their movements and doing these things. And like, just anecdotally from people with Parkinson's, they were like, oh, I have to really think about my movement and I have to practice it every day and like, you know, warm myself up so that I'm able to get um, a little bit freer. And they were like, oh, well, that's what dancers are doing. So, you know, then people started doing it. And then there was like this excess of programs of like uh, the Dance for PD program and other programs. So 
I think that it's um, that there's been more funding in dance for Parkinson's because once it started to show that it was beneficial, like, you know, other people began be were able to research it. So I wouldn't say that there's anything that is, um, you know, uh, not beneficial or, you know, that there's a disadvantage to researching the others. I actually would say that it's probably more advantageous now to research the others because there's less research right and less uh there's like a wide open unanswered questions in a lot of these other um other populations right um and that each disease is also um specific in its symptomology and it's the disease progression and you know the underlying factors so like that there um you know has been this benefit in parkinson's and like what people are doing with huntington's and stroke is taking from the Parkinson's literature and then applying it to these other populations. But like, you know, we also might need their own program that's not based in dance for Parkinson's or that's like, you know, different, different things. Or, you know, maybe dance has not been like, I would hate to say this, but maybe dance is not beneficial for every, you know, neurological disorder. Like we know that it has shown benefits in, in these disorders, but it just hasn't been, um, it hasn't been researched enough. Right, sir. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. So uh, wrapping up the talk, I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Gregory and everyone here for making this a huge success. And I also extend my gratitude to the School of Biology and our faculty advisor, Dr. Sodananda, for their continued guidance and support, as well as our sponsors, uh, Mebiom Therapeutics and JKG Biosciences, for their generous contributions. So thank you all, and uh, I hope we see you at the remaining talks as we as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.